My name is Sukrit Ranjan. And Sukrit, are we alone in the universe? Uh, that's a good question, and I don't know yet. I think the nice thing about our time is that in 40 years, we probably will have an idea, an answer to that question. And when I asked the question, are we alone, what did you understand by the word we? By we, I understood humanity. That is to say, like, you know, what seems to be, a, what, seems to be what we call a sentient species on Earth. Are we alone on Earth? Uh, in the sense that there seems to be only one terrestrial biosphere that uses common principles of biochemistry, yes. In the sense that there doesn't seem to be other sentient tool using species on Earth. There, say that sentence again. There doesn't seem to be any sentient tool using species on other Earth. Other than us. Than us. Yeah, so, so, I, so I, guess, uh, I guess I've been, I have not properly defined terminology. I guess what I would do now is define we to mean the terrestrial biosphere. You're uh, changing now from yeah, humanity I would to change. terrestrial biosphere. You're, you're asking the question has actually clarified my thinking, so thank you for that. Uh, I now define we to mean the terrestrial biosphere, and the you, question, are we alone, to mean do there exist other biospheres other than that on Earth in the universe? So, but now we're plagued with the uh, ambiguity of what a biosphere is. Instead mm -hmm. of asking what humanity is, now you're making me ask you, what is life? Mm -hmm. And you think that's, uh, you have a clear idea of what that is? I don't have a, so there's the uh, NASA definition that we're all familiar with, which is, you know, self-replicating chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution. Uh, that seems like a useful working definition to me, but I don't have a really clear sense of what is and what is not life. But I figure we'll know it when we see it. Okay. Now you said um, it's an important question. Why do you think it's an important question? Hmm. Uh, I guess it's important on a couple of, uh, to me, on a couple of related axes. One of them is, I guess, the kind of fundamental philosophical one. I feel like we have always wondered whether or not we're alone, whether we're uh, the only life in the universe or whether there's other life out there. We've wondered this question for many millennia now, and it'd be nice to have an answer to that question. Similar to al always is different from many millennia. Many millennia is about 2,000 years or 3,000. Yeah. Always is, I guess, 4 billion years or however long you want to say humans are, 100,000 or 200,000. Yeah. So which of those, did you really mean 200,000 years as long as there have been humans? I guess I don't have constraints on that, but we do have constraints from the writings of various philosophers going back a few thousand years, so two or three thousand years, mm -hmm. that indicate that it's been a that it seems to have been a question in their societies during that time. So that's why I would argue, I would I would argue we have data for a few thousand years. So that's you a mean the Greeks? Um, you I don't mean the Chinese or the Indians or? I believe those community. Uh, I I believe that's kind of worldwide. I know the Greeks had the question. I know the I believe the Indians also had the question. I would bet the Chinese probably did also. It seems to have been one of those universal constants. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so you think it, this is an important question? To me, it's an important question, and um, yeah, so it's kind of important on that fundamental philosophical level, and it's also important in terms of, I guess, just understanding the fundamental laws of how life works. Uh, for example, if there exists, if all life in the universe seems pretty similar to our own, for example, in the sense that it uses like DNA, RNA, proteins, that kind of stuff, that implies that. Uh, that would, that would imply that there would only seem to be one real way to make uh, chemi biochemistry work. If, on the other hand, there's a bunch of different forms of life, like, I don't know, weird life that uses, who knows, that uses alternate solvents or that uses, that, you know, like gas bag life, like Carl Sagan talked about, that would imply that uh, there's much more of a drive, th that many more kinds of biology are possible, which would be interesting to know in of itself. So in the question, are we alone, I've asked you about we, Mm -hmm. Now let me ask you about the word alone. If I weren't in this room, would you be alone? I suppose in a sense that we would, I suppose in a sense I would be in an immediate sense, but in a broader sense I'd know that there would be other human beings or, and other forms of life near me. So I guess this is a bit of a cheat, but I would argue that uh, both yes and no is correct, depending on what CNC mean it in. Hmm. Do you think we are... Uh, you think this question fascinates humans because we're a social species and the word alone is kind of a little bit of a stigma? Hmm, that's a really good question that I, haven't, that I have not thought about closely. Let me try to take a moment to reflect on that. <laughs> you remind me of Wittgenstein here. <laughs> that argument actually does seem relatively reasonable to me. I haven't thought about the fundamentals of why humans uh, seem to feel that it's an important question, but that hypothesis seems as plausible as any other that I might be able to come up with. So if we were non-social species, we probably wouldn't care whether we were alone or not. 
Uh, potentially. One could argue that there exist uh, fundamental reasons to care if there are other species in the universe. Uh, uh, from this, like, I know this is kind of science fictional, but like, one can imagine that in the far future, um, if there exist other species uh, and they view themselves as competitors, they might be a threat. If, on the other hand, there exist other species and they are potential uh, trading partners or something, they might be like a positive to, to finding them. I ask this because about half the people I speak to have spoken to think that if we find microbes on Mars, half people think we will still be alone, and the other half will say, oh, we're not alone anymore. What if we do find microbes on Mars? What is your view? Um, I guess this is a little bit of an emotional question for me. It's not as much logical as we one might like. To me, if we find microbes on Mars and we, you know, in the distant future, sequence their DNA and find they fit into phylogenetic trees on Earth such that it's likely that they're descended from life that's been panspermically transferred to Mars from Earth, that wouldn't answer for me to some degree the question we are alone because it would seem to me to some way to be an aspect of Earth life or terrestrial life. Mm. If on the other hand, um, it's clear that, that that life on Mars did not originate from Earth, then to me that would be a signal that we are not alone because it's, a, it's an independent genesis, it's an independent uh, instantiation of life. Now, I assume that you're like me and you think that a, a scientific understanding of our origins is somehow uh, helps us. You, think it, you don't think it makes you a better person to have a scientific or more correct understanding of how you came, from, where, how you got here, rather than just believe in a, some religious dogma? Um, I think I would want to define more precisely what better meant. Uh, I, don't, I don't really, th I think... Well, if you find out more stuff about yourself, what, does, what kind of qualitative in, or important change does that make in you? To me, I think just understanding how things work is in of itself better in multiple axes. For me, I guess personally, there's this kind of joy in understanding how things work better. It just makes me feel, and I think many other people feel more satisfied. And I think more broadly, understanding how the, how the universe works tends to improve human well-being in the long term. For example, like uh, one example I like to cite is you know quantum electrodynamics. That seemed like a really obscure branch of research that had no real relevance at day to day. People were just trying to really understand how the fundamental forces worked. And I think now it's really helped us with a lot of chip development and things like that. So it's been become very helpful for the human economy and uh, you know enabling smartphones and stuff like that. So you think the ability to kill yourself is useful? Uh, I would put, uh, do you, by the ability to kill yourself, do you, you refer to the idea that the more we understand, the more technological we get, the easier it is for us to kill each other and possibly yeah. our, ourselves? Yes. Uh -huh. I can definitely see where you're coming from there. My argument would be that with any power, there's a danger of its misuse. Uh, overall, whether through our own self-interest or whether through a, uh, shared moral principles, we seem to have been improving in our ability to deploy this power over time. And broadly speaking, I think uh, I have a lot of faith in humanity. I tend to feel that in the long term, we'll use our understanding wisely. So if I gave you $100 billion with the caveat, you have to spend this money to help answer the question, are we alone? How would you spend it? Uh, this is a good question, and it depends on time skills to some degree. Uh, I think I would have to do a lot more close study of what the relevant technologies are. If, if it turns out that it's realistically possible to build an instrument that can go out and, uh, you know, uh, something like the Terrestrial Planet Finder, that to build an instrument that can go out and search a bunch of nearby stars for potential evidence of life, that might be a good use of part of the money, say $30 billion or $40 billion. But I would argue that the rest of the money is best invested in developing human capital globally from the point of view that uh, if you give a few people a lot of money, they're kind of saturated in what they can do with it. There's only so much money you can throw at a problem. Whereas if you enable a bunch of people to liberate their human capital and to use that intelligence for a variety of purposes, then there's potentially much greater growth that's possible. So you'd invest in primary education all over the world? I would probably tend to do that. Primary education, primary nutrition, obvious public health things like uh, getting rid of um, parasites that infest people that is a relatively cost-effective solution. And I would argue, for me, like a lot of these questions, like how does life starve the search for life on other worlds, I highly suspect it's going to end up being more like building a cathedral than the moon race in the sense that I doubt that, I doubt that even if you throw a bunch of money at it, you can do it in a decade. There's just too many, people need a certain amount of time to think and cogitate and to do things over. So I think that improve, like you want to invest a small amount, a small but steady amount of money uh, over time and mm -hmm. eventually we'll solve this problem. And of course, if you want to find out whether we're alone or not, we have to stay alive. Yes. Uh, so, you, so I guess part of your money is investing in primary education is 
ensuring that we uh, humans will survive in this, in the, under the assumption that the more educated you are, the more unlikely you are to kill yourself? I would argue that um, people, okay, this is again me expressing my personal biases, so not scientifically backed necessarily. I would argue that people in general tend to be good, and I would argue that um, people in general want to do good in the world, so if you give people the tools to do more, they will in general use it to do good and like not try to kill each other and kill themselves. Well, here we are at a conference and we're learning more about the origin of life, or we're trying to learn more about, do you think mm -hmm. that'll make you less likely to be an evil evil genius scientist or create weapons or, or engage in war? I think one of the challenges with fundamental research, and in particular far future fundamental research that has an impact much further down the line, it's, is it's hard to draw a direct line from one to the other. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of, the, of a link to world peace or something like that, I don't see a direct pathway he, from here. But one thing I, that is kind of inspiring here is that you have people from a lot of different parts of the world, many different cultures, and all of them are coming together and talking to each other in a civil way and focused on uh, studying a common goal, which is, which is trying to understand the potentials for the emergence of, uh, potentially how life emerged on Earth and its potentials for the emergence on other worlds. Do you have a favorite solution to the Fermi paradox? You know, I used to, but now I say that it's pointless having a favorite solution when we're in an age where we can go out and constrain a lot of the parameters in the, in the Fermi equation, and hopefully we will, we'll be able to tell directly. Well, what, what used to be your solution? My preferred solution in the deep past used to be either that it's really hard... <laughs> yeah, deep past, like yesterday. <laughs> like 10 years ago, I would say, before I started thinking about these questions more seriously. Okay, and 10 years ago as it was... Uh, yeah, I, I would. It was either that perhaps it's very hard to get life started, or that we t that life tends to nuke itself. Life. Life tends to destroy itself. So self destruction. I, yeah, ten years ago, I was also slightly more pessimistic about human nature. Okay, and so today, what is your view on the fairy paradox? My view is that um, it's pointless to have a view on it in the sense that what we should really be doing is trying to constrain the different parameters of the Drake equation directly. Such, such that we can eventually figure out what is the state cause of the Fermi paradox. For example, we already know that uh, r uh, rocky planets that receive a temperate amount of stellar radiation are common. So th th that's those constraints to nail down already. If in the future we detect a bunch of simple microbial life on uh, certain classes of planet, we, and we, sh we show that uh, you know, simple life is common, maybe the bottleneck is in, uh, in, in finding intelligent life, or maybe that life tends to just nuke itself. What do you think of the astrobiological logic of saying we should find out what has evolved several times independently on Earth and that, and that aspect becomes a, our best candidates for what we should expect elsewhere? This is a, uh, a new idea to me, so I have not thought about it in a serious way. I suppose I, and I, supp I don't think my answer on this has much value because I am not an evolutionary biologist and I haven't thought about it in a serious way compared to other people. Okay. Naively, I would argue that I'm not sure that necessarily uh, has a lot of constraining power because it's sensitive to some degree on the particular conditions that are available here on Earth. For example, one thing that I, one thing that I understand has emerged multiple times here on Earth is eyes. I think species keep uh, developing and losing vision and then developing it again. I might be wrong on that. But one could imagine that um, if life independently evolves in a very dark environment like Europa, maybe they have, uh, the, under, the, you know, the dark oceans of Europa, maybe there's no particular reason for them to develop eyes. Now, I asked you, I gave you $100 billion. Would you use any of that $100 billion to invest in, let's say, microscopes to look for nano aliens that might be in this room, for example? Nano micro or nano spaceships that are built by aliens and they're all over the universe? Ah, oh, you're thinking like vo something like some galactic von Neumann machines or something like that. Nano von Neumann machines. Yeah. Uh huh. Um, I probably wouldn't b because right now I don't have any particular reason to expect that they're there. On the other hand, I do have particular reason to expect that. So I don't see a high scientific. I yeah. don't see a high. Li uh, my expected scientific return from that study isn't high right now. You don't think we've miniaturized and continue to miniaturize our technology and makes you know, satellites into CubeSats, into microsatellites, and there's a, I guess that, that looks like a progression, some kind of technological progression that we're making that would not be paralleled elsewhere? I, I can certainly see that being possible, but I think uh, looking for that requ requires assuming that uh, not only does life emerge commonly, but also it's technological life and it survives long enough to develop to this degree, and it decides the thing to do is to send all these things out. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of unknowns there whose 
whose probabilities I don't know, but seem to be, because of the Fermi paradox that you pointed out, seems to be relatively, the probabilities of them probably skew lower rather than higher. Mm. Now, y you, like many human beings, have a, a brain and 100 billion neurons. I, I think that none of those individual neurons know that they're inside your brain and what they're part of. Do you think that we could be inside of an alien and not know it, like the neurons in your head are inside of your head and don't know it? I think the idea you trace here goes back to a, an idea that's, I think, at this point, a couple of thousand years old, which is the idea that uh, how do you know that you're not someone else's dream? Uh, and my answer to that is I don't, uh, but or I guess we don't know that, but there's two, the way I think about it is that there are two options. Either the world, the physical world is as it seems to be, in which case we should keep doing what we're doing, or that we're all a dream or an instantiation of someone else's consciousness or in, you know, buried in some quantum computer somewhere. Can, aren't, why are those mutually exclusive? Can you repeat that one more time, please? Why do you? Uh, why are you assuming that those two scenarios are mutually exclusive? I don't. I, I guess uh, naively, I would assume. I, I guess naively, I didn't see how they could be the same. Either like, what? Like, how can we both be an instantiation, a, a, someone else's dream, and be physical and real, and so on and so forth? Well, for example, if an alien creates a really, really good simulation, for example, that's not really a dream. It's and it's also the laws of physics are inside, and so. You, you would be, it would hard, be hard to tell the difference. Or you, it could be simultaneously the production of an alien civilization and real in the sense that you said. Mm -hmm. I guess there's two different scenarios there. I guess if, I guess if we're inbuilt in a computer simulation and we legitimately have, uh, I would argue that if we legitimately have free will and randomness as possible and stuff like that, then I would agree. There, there is no necessary boundary between the two. It's possible to be realistically alive and independent and so on and so forth. Yeah, in that case, I guess there's no meaningful distinction between the simulation and a and universe. Um, um, do you, if there's life everywhere, do you, do you have any idea what fraction of it would, we would be able to describe as human-like intelligent? Or, for example, I think, did you say that you think that we're not alone in the universe? Or I guess you said we don't know. My personal bias is to think that we're not alone in the universe. Okay, so let's work with that mm -hmm. hypothesis. Now, in that situation, if that's the case, what fraction of these other life forms will, would have a human-like intelligence, do you think? Tech, could build tech uh, cameras and radio telescopes. Huh. You know, I have no idea. I think, I think we have to... S I, I don't know to what degree SETI, SETI has constrained this by looking for Earth-like, human-like technological civilizations. But I don't know how much constraining power their civilization, their observations have. For example, like I believe terrestrial radio emissions have been dropping steadily over time as we shift more and more of our communications traffic from things that bio, like radio waves that bounce off of the ionosphere to like undersea cable and, and things like that. So maybe like the radio loud phase is just a very narrow period of a species' existence. Okay. Now comes a part of the interview where I want you to turn off your rational brain and just talk to your emotional brain, kind of like close your eyes and just feel. And the question is, what kind of aliens would you like to find hmm. emotionally? Are you talking sentient aliens or uh, non-sentient? I'm asking your emotional self what type of aliens they would like to find. Wow, that's like being asked, what if you owned the world? What would you do with it? It's like something that doesn't really come up, so I, uh, I haven't thought about it closely. I suppose there's... Um, there's two axes. One... Wait, 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 wait. Am I talking to your emotional self or your rational self here? Because I'd like to talk to your emotional self. Uh, emotional cells usually don't talk about, it. hey, there are two axes. <laughs> That's true. All right. I guess if, I guess if I was really just emotioning, indulging my inner id, I would want uh, to find species that are like us in some way. Like in the sense that they're, uh, they're similar enough to, uh, enough to us that we can have uh, good conversations with them, interact with them, and maybe build a civilization together or something like that. So you smart ones, so know a lot, not stupid ones. That would be ideal, yes. And presumably ones that won't kill you. Yeah, yeah, I would, co some sense of cooperation would be nice. I would, I'd prefer not to live in that whole, uh, the universe of that author who wrote the, uh, the three-body problem. That seems like oh. a very unpleasant universe. Oh, I haven't read that. So uh, would you like to have mammalian aliens rather than reptilian aliens? Because most, as, ma as mammals, we tend to be attracted to mammals. Other mammals. Rather. No preference. No preference. Yeah. Okay. They could um, be giant gas bags. As long as we can talk to them, that's all that matters to me. Talk to them. Okay. Now, 
Arthur C. Clarke said any sufficiently advanced technology will be indistinguishable from magic, but there's a Canadian-German philosopher who said, no, Arthur, you're wrong. Any sufficiently advanced technology will be uh, indistinguishable from nature. And if Carl, the second guy, is right, then presumably the SETI people are going to have a hard time of it because if you're indistinguishable from nature, then by, almost by definition, then you can't be detected. What, what do you think of those two comments? I think uh, this is the first time I've heard the second one, and it sounds, to me, it sounds like it's probably pretty fundamental, so I haven't given it enough thought yet. Uh, just reacting immediately and very naively, I don't understand what uh, this philosopher is trying to say. He's trying to say that as technologies get more advanced, they become more sustainable and tree-hugging, and the forests mm -hmm. are all still there rather than cutting them down and making an uh, industry park, I think. Mm -hmm. Or investing, instead of investing in gadgets that are magical like cell phones, you, your cell phones are so sophisticated that it's compatible with nature and the way things were before you use technology to control the earth. To me, I, I don't, I, uh, to me that seems like a little bit like a false dichotomy in the sense that there's no reason uh, sufficiently advanced technology can't be both. Like, uh, mm -hmm. for example, one, we, our species needs a lot of food because there's a lot of us. Right now that scars the land pretty bad because we have to convert a lot of it to cropland and for grazing use and stuff like that. And one could imagine that, you know, 200 years from now, we will build uh, giant farming colonies out in space, that just free-floating facilities that, use solar, that convert solar radiation into uh, into food for into food and ship that back down to earth. But that sounds more like magic than uh, nature. But uh, to me, that's magic. That's preserving nature because if you're getting all your food from space where there's no existing life, then you can let the biosphere on Earth return to what it used to be. Right, but it sounds like it's detectable in the sense of it's it's different from things without some type of intelligence that has built these colonies in space. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't fully so understand that. If I looked at uh, this planet and I say, oh, it's a nice green planet, but around it was some artificial satellite yeah. with plants inside, I say, whoa, that's, that's not nature. That's more like some type of intelligent civilization yeah. has done it. I guess, I guess for me, uh, being like earth huggy and stuff like that doesn't mean leaving nature pristine as though humans didn't, didn't exist. To me, like, there's no reason to pre preference that one way or the other. To me, the important part is like, trying to keep as light a footprint on other life as possible because to some degree I think other life also has a, has a claim to exist and do its own thing. Mm -hmm. And so from that perspective, I would argue that uh, the key priority should be to kind of preserve and protect life as opposed to preserve and protect pristine environments. Oh. Like if there's no life on Mars, I'm totally fine with terraforming it. If there's life on Mars, we should not terraform it. Hmm. Now, you've seen the movie Contact? Yes. Now, in that movie, I think three times somebody says, um, are we alone? And the answer is, well, if we are, it's an awful waste of space. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that comment? I think to some degree it's true. Actually, I think, to, again, this is me reflecting my personal biases. To me, it's largely true in the sense that I think life makes the universe more beautiful. And again, I guess you're right, we're social animals. So to me, like having other people out there, other civilizations to think about, talk, to, talk with, is nicer than the universe where that's not the case. So I like to think that the universe, I, in, I, my ideal universe my, would be a universe that's teeming with life. Okay. And presumably uh, nice life rather than warlike life. Yes. Life that, tends, that is an eternal war with each other does not sound great to me. Now, when I asked you about your, some of your favorite aliens, you didn't mention Star Trek or District 9. Deep Space Nine, yeah. Deep Space Nine, okay. Yeah. Deep Space Nine. The, but you like the aliens there or you've been inspired by them? I would argue that uh, what inspires me from those series in particular is the, the spirit of kind of exploration they, they have of like going out and discovering new things. And I think that's less a reflection on my views in aliens in general and more a, re a reflection of my personal biases in general that I think discovering new things is interesting and finding new people who think new ways is a very interesting and I like learning from them. And that's what they tend to do in that show a lot. So that's a, a personally a, motiv a motivation for me, but uh, I, don't, I, don't, I hope it doesn't significantly influence my approach to science. Well, one critique, uh, or one criti critique that I have of these shows is that they, to go, well, they're looking for brave new worlds or other types of life, and it seems to me that we're, it seems to me that uh, it reminds me of Prester John, and that the medieval Christians were said, oh, somebody's going to save us, or there's a Christian over there that we should go looking for, and it just reminds me of 
you know, here we are, these human beings, are, we're a certain type of life form, and what are we doing? We're looking for that certain type of life form elsewhere. So that's, that's why I call it the Prester John fallacy. Do you think there's any force to that uh, critique? Uh, you mean the fallacy that we're looking for life that's like us because we want to find it? Because that's the only thing we're interested in, I guess. It's kind of like, well, I'm not interested in difference. I'm interested in something like me, something that can, uh, I guess, tell us the answers to all our questions about physics or something. I think, the, I think the latter part of what you said, something that can tell us all the answers to something like physics, is not what I'm looking for in the sense that I highly doubt that any, any other civilization would have it. I think it'd be more fun to have a peer civilization that... A peer civilization? Yeah, with whom we could work on these topics. Whoa. A peer uh, civilization. You know that the time frames are so, will be so different, like billions of years, and mm -hmm. a billion years ago or two billion years ago, you were an amoeba. Mm -hmm. So you, that's a lot... To, you don't talk to amoebas, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Okay, Again, so we're talking we're talking about personal biases, I think, here to some degree. Well, the, but the, the idea that you say a peer presumably means something that is within two million years of the time frame of mm -hmm. where we are today, I guess. Yeah. Huh. Um, and then that's kind very of, unlikely. Uh, I I don't know. I don't know the probability distribution functions for how civilizations advance. Is there a point where which we tend to plateau? Civilizations tend to plateau, or something like that. You're hoping for that because that would be that's what you would need in order to have find legitimately have a probability of finding a peer. Yeah, or, or like, you know, a bunch of science fiction authors have postulated that eventually we all, t uh, civilizations will tend to singularity and go post-physical. So that's a natural mechanism for uh, uh, why there aren't super long-lived civilizations around. Something nicer happens to them. Well, um, but going back to the Prester John thing, I think I, one thing I wanted to point out, I, I, I thought about that point a little bit, and um, I think one of the things that people argue now is to some degree that Prester, the ideal of Prester John was inspired by uh, Ethiopia which was uh, a Christian kingdom that lived, that was widely separated from Europe and was in a, you know, uh, a largely non-Christian part of the world. So to some degree, Prester John existed. It just was not in the, quite in the way or structure that uh, perhaps the medieval, medieval Europeans thought it did. Well, I think they were, they were hoping that Prester John would save them from the, the uh, I guess, the Mongol onslaught that was mm -hmm. happening there. Um, what do you think are the public's or students' uh, biggest misconceptions about the question, are we alone? Hmm. I don't know because I haven't done any kind of extensive survey. And to be honest, most of the public I've interacted with and most of the students I've interacted with have uh, n known an awful lot about, the t about this topic. And, have had a w and the things that, on which uh, I don't personally, um, uh, on which I might not sh personally share their views, our views are questions on which we don't have any strong constraints. So there's no reason to pri privilege my views over theirs. Okay, do you have any advice for students or people who are thinking of becoming astrobiologists and trying to help answer this question? Uh, I, guess the, I guess the easiest advice is the one that everyone uh, who works in this field gets, which is uh, maintain astrobiology as a research focus, to, but don't be exclusive on this because um, astrobiology is, again, one of those things in which you're going to make progress on very long timescales. And if you want to build a career, you need to find other questions that are empirically testable on which you can make progress on shorter timescales. So if you're interested in it from the planetary side, figure out what observations you can make of Mars or Titan or exoplanets that are accessible within the next few decades. Or if you're interested in it from the biology side, figure out some kind of interesting phylogenetic analyses or something you can do in the more recent time scale. And uh, last question, uh, again, are, are we alone? I hope not. Uh, I don't know. But I think we'll find out in the next four decades. Four decades? Yes. W why that time frame? Well, um, this, again, th th this is my personal bias. I I'm not saying that this can't happen, but I pers from, the, from the simulations that have been put forward in the literature, I'm not confident of our abilities to precisely characterize the atmospheres of, uh, of, of exoplanets for at least the next two decades. I think we're really going to need a, direct, a much more sophisticated technology to come online, and the timeline I've seen on that is about three decades. More than that, for us to real robustly, like I, we, even if we detect a biosignature, for me that isn't going to be firm evidence of life beyond Earth, a putative biosignature like O2, because we'll really, what we'll really need to do is fir develop a firm understanding of how planets are and how they work, and then to be able to, and then we'll have to find the oddballs that, uh, that don't look like how how abiotic planets work, that are, would really be the signature of biology. You don't think that 40 years has anything to do with the amount of time that you'll be on Earth? I don't think so. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't think that's that's strongly connected to it. In particular, because I hope to live much longer than forty years. <laughs> uh, but also because it's okay if I if, 
<laughs> you know, it's building a cathedral. When people built cathedrals, they were, they were often finished centuries after them. So they knew, they knew there was no chance they were going to finish it, but it was enough to contribute to a task that was important. 